Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Jen Lim is on a mission to change the way people think about work. She is the CEO and Chief Happiness Officer of Delivering Happiness, a company that she and Zappos CEO, Tony Shea, co-created to inspire passion and purpose in the workplace for a happier world. Most of us just want to be happy, but it turns out, Jen says, we're pretty bad at predicting the things that actually make us happy. That's where Delivering Happiness comes in using the science of positive psychology to deliver tangible ways to increase happiness in our organizations. On today's show, Jen talks about the science behind happiness, where true happiness comes from, and the four-part happiness framework. Let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Jen Lim. Jen Lim, it is so awesome to have you on, the happiness chica. I love it. This is cool. So tell me this. How do you define happiness? So for us, we always bring it back to the science of it. Uh, So that being, the reason being, we we know there's going to be people that kind of, you know, look at or think of when they, they think of what we do in happiness probably have some concerns, basically the naysayers of what this could be. So that's why we drill it back to science. And based on scientific evidence and also positive psychology, a few things just crest up as to what happiness really means. So number one is being true to your authentic self. We call it weird self because we believe everyone's kind of weird in some way, but in a good way. So number one, be true to your authentic self live out your senses of flow and passion and live out ultimately a sense of higher purpose. So what is it that we are doing that's greater than just ourselves? And so time and time again, across any, uh, you know, academic or um, any type of research that we've come across, these themes consistently get pulled out as to what true, meaningful and authentic happiness can be. Sure, sure. By the way, you know, we had a chance to speak together at LeaderCast Women, which was really cool. Not together, but on the same stage at different times. But, you know, and to me, um, you know, purpose does. It certainly helps drive our happiness, but it, of course, helps us overcome the the challenges in our lives that get us to that happy place. So, And that's a huge point because um, our stance is that, you know, you can't be fundamentally happy every second of the day, it's really being able to build a a grounding within self to know that there's going to be those ups and downs. We call them heartbeats, but um, essentially like being able to have that grounding to be able to, you know, celebrate those highs in life, but also embrace those lows because we believe that happiness, true happiness is actually not just informed by those high moments, but really informed by those low ones too. And what we get out of it, you know, someone getting sick or passing away in our lives or losing a job or, you know, just facing this uncertain world. Um, when we have that fundamental happiness and sense of purpose, then then we can take those on with a uh, with a different lens. For sure. You know, and you talk about sort of the happiness ROI, right? So when we think about happiness at work, tell me this, why does happiness at work matter? Yeah. So it comes down to being able to get, like if we, we're talking from the ROI perspective, so if we have a CFO hat on, it's about, well, how do we retain the good people? How do we attract, you know, good talent? How do we... Um, increase innovation? How do we make sure people are engaged and productive in their day-to-days for the greater goal of, you know, the company or organization? So happy is just happens to be this term that we use just because it's so universal at the end of the day of what you know, human beings can be to ultimately be their, be their best selves and thrive at whatever they're doing. So it just makes sense whether it's in work or life to be able to kind of encourage this kind of 
behaviors of people to be true to themselves, you know, have that freedom that they feel that they can control, um, you know, their decisions and be accountable and be trusted. And it all kind of adds up to if that every single person is doing that, then therefore all these teams are doing it and therefore the whole company is doing it. It adds to the ROI, both the bottom line and the top line. Uh, there's been tons of studies done now, uh, especially in the last five, 10 years, whether it's Harvard Business Review or the Economist that shows that if you increase these factors of meaningful happiness, then it comes to a greater output. Uh, ultimately, sales teams sell more things, products and services. You know, creative teams get more innovative. And at the end of the day, we've just seen a high correlation to you know meaningful happiness to things like profitability and engagement and productivity in the end. So if I'm a CFO of a company, I mean, they, they love, right, to understand the ROI against um, all the behaviors and, and the outflows. What, do you, what would you tell a leader inside of an organization that wanted to sort of deploy two or three things tomorrow in order to create a happier workplace in order to, you know, increase ROI? One way that we look at it is that, you know, a lot of companies tend to focus on customer lifetime value, which is really important. What we also uh, say is equally as important is uh, ELTV, so employee lifetime value. And if you want to be able to see very clearly the black and white of that ROI is that you understand there's a lifetime, you know, a life cycle for every employee that starts from recruiting to onboarding to training to management and growth and development, and ultimately they, you know, might leave. So if you look at that arc, that life cycle, and you just focus on any one of those pain points or you know opportunity points that is being challenged. So let's just say it's retention. Uh, so if you can just imagine this graph and be able to say, okay, well, this is what happened with our retention, uh, you know, whatever, 25, 50% turnover rate before we implemented these type of happy slash culture programs in our workplace. And then you can see over time, let's just say these employees that used to be, you know, leaving after a year or a year and a half, now you see them actually staying on for two years or three years. So then it becomes a really hardcore calculation as to, oh, well, therefore we're saving this much more money because we know once we have a turnover, um, we're losing about 150 to 300% of that person's salary to go through that transition, find a new person, um, do the training, yada, yada, yada. So that's more on like the more uh, era calculation side of ROI. Right, right. How else do you measure it? Well, that's the biggest point of being able to like tie it to your metrics that you're already calculating. Um, there's also things that now that we have a scientific way to look at happiness, there's a lot of tools and surveys out there that we use to be able to show I think it used to be called engagement surveys, and we know uh, now more than ever that they're not very effective when engagement surveys are collecting this data and not, you know, and companies aren't doing anything with it. So we're trying to like steer it to a place where we're collecting data around meaningful happiness of every employee, so therefore teams, and use that as a tool to measure and correlate, okay, so this is where our happiness levels are, and this is where our sales are, or this is where our productivity is, things like that. And be able to say, okay, because we saw this spike of happiness here, we're actually seeing an increase in sales and profitability here. So that's how we try to tie these things together. So that's it's not one or the other, but basically seeing the relationship between them. And so is happiness sort of an end or is it a byproduct? You know, I've studied your happiness framework, which I dig. It's really, really cool. So is it an end or a byproduct? And, and how does this, you know, apply to companies when they think about it that way? I guess it's a bit of both. Um, because the ideal world, of course, is like, yeah, of course, we all want to be happy, but we know that's not going to be the case. So because of that, we just see it as this continuous journey of what can be done in the course of a day or a month or a year to impact and improve our happiness levels and therefore see the results from it. So I think it's important to like, you know, of course we all have a sense of like what we want, what our goals are, but realizing along the way that it's going to take 
an effort <laughs> and it's not always, you know, it's not always going to be uh, rainbows and unicorns type thing. It's really like, well, how along the way by testing things out within our lives, do we get to that point of what we define as, you know, true sustainable happiness is? Well, and you talk about it in this happiness framework, right? Which I love, you know, having a sense of control, a sense of progress, you know, connectedness, vision and meeting. And can you kind of expand on that a little bit? Because what I'm seeing is that sort of the framework, you know, sort of the number one framework for happiness and the, the levers, if you will, are control, progress, connectedness and vision, which feels so real to me, right? When I look at those things and I think of moments in my own life when I'm happiest, I, I think of those four things, right? That feels real to me. I, I don't know if there's anything missing or not, but that's, I'm sure, anchored in a tremendous amount of research that you have done. But tell us more about that, if you would. Yeah, of course. So you described exactly right. Like we, we, we consider these the levers of what we can do with happiness so that we're focusing not what's wrong with us, but how can we focus on what's actually going okay with us and dial that up. So these levers across the board of all the studies we've seen and now we've seen it, you know, in actuality in workplaces are essentially what's been researched to show that if we focus on these points, then we can actually increase our authentic, meaningful happiness. So sense of control, um, to backstory this, is that basically we're taking these concepts and trying to make it really practical in our day-to-day lives and therefore in our workplaces. So sense of control, how do we increase employees and team members' sense of control is being able to give them more you know, trust and give them more decision-making power so that they feel that, you know, they've been empowered and trusted with this decision. So it could be even as simple as allowing uh, everyone to create their own titles. And it sounds so, you know, it might sound silly, but there is a sense of, oh, if I'm going to create my title, then I'm going to own this position. So as an example, there's a someone that worked at the front desk of a doctor's office and she just, you know, this is a frontline job and some might pe- some people might think it's just kind of mundane, but she owned it because <laughs> she has a business card and the title is director of first impressions. And that kind of might sound silly for some people, but it gives them a sense like, you know, I'm going to own whatever I'm, do, I'm doing and do the best I can. So that's an example of sense of control. Sense of progress is basically making sure people feel like they're growing, they're learning, they're developing in some way. Uh, so uh, a lot of the times what we encourage workplaces to do is to uh, take surveys of not just, uh, you know, what their engagement is or whatever, but what their strengths are. And what we found is it goes back to the sense of flow. And it's a concept, it's a psychological term developed by a, a dude named Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi. <laughs> Actually, I need to work on that flow of that state. <laughs> Saying his name, but Mikhail Csikszentmihalyi. And essentially, it's like flow is like when you're doing something, you're so engrossed in it, and it feels like minutes go by, but actually hours go by. So just imagine if we were to survey all our team members and get a sense of what their flows are. And so by understanding that, and then instilling that and, and embedding that in their job, in their responsibilities and role, just, you know, being able to give them that sense of like, oh, these are the other things I'm good at that I, it's not necessarily what I'm doing on a day to day. But because I'm now allowed to like, you know, be able to get in that sense of flow, then they feel that sense of progress and therefore much more productive on a day to day basis. So that's um uh, that's the example of, of um, you know, sense of progress. The third thing you had mentioned uh, in, the, in our framework is the sense of connectedness. And this one's super simple. It's just, you know, how do we increase meaningful relationships within the workplace? And it's not essentially, you know, throwing a happy hour. It's, it's a little bit more than that. Um, you know, engaging in fun times and, and things like that are important, but meaningful relationships really come back to really understanding each other because, and knowing each other. Cause we, we tend to work harder, not just for our coworkers. We tend to work harder for our friends. So getting out of the box of what that workplace mentality and interaction is and understanding, oh, these are your values. Uh, this is your higher purpose. And, you know, it goes on and on. And these are you know, just understanding that person at a different level creates that connectedness of, um, you know, and the meaningful one um, that has scientifically shown that that will increase your happiness as well. I mean, we spend so many hours in the workplace, more than our friends and family, so might as well make that worthwhile. 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so you've got to create the space inside of those environments for that connectedness to happen. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where you know, our services come in just because we're able to help organizations get alignment. And alignment is a big thing these days of just, you know, even come to the table and get a bunch of leaders in the room and ask about their values and ask about the higher purpose. And it's really interesting. Nine times out of 10, they all have different definitions of it. So we get to the point of defining values and defining behaviors out of those values and being able to use that as the foundation of what the company stands for. And then in our process, we take that foundation and actually help uh, companies live them on a day-to-day basis. So how do you instill things like core values in in all your organizational systems, like recruiting and um, training and development, uh, rewards and recognition, all the things that make companies work at the end of the day. Uh, and that's how we create a sustainable environment of strong culture and, and positive ROI. Yeah. And that, you know, just for people that are listening, when, when Jen says that, right, she's the CEO and chief happiness officer of delivering happiness. So um, that's what you're alluding to, which is which is really cool. So number four, vision and meaning. Tell us about that. Um, well, that's pretty much alluding back to what we started talking about in terms of that higher purpose, uh, being able to define pretty specifically. And, and we're always learning about what, you know, who we really are and what we really want and what we're doing that's outside of just, you know, our day-to-day grind. Uh, so being able to say, you know, why do we do the things we do on a day-to-day basis? And it could be as simple as putting on a post-it note or just having it ingrained in your head. Because no matter at that point, if we can define that vision and meaning, even the most, um, you know, menial task, uh, seemingly, can mean something because we know it's adding and working towards that greater goal of living towards that higher purpose. Yeah, that's cool. You know, Jen, I have to tell you this story. So my first job when I got down to Atlanta and wanted to get into sports was I worked at the Super Bowl host committee and I I answered the phones and, you know, Super Bowl 28, this is Molly, you know, hundreds of times a day. And and to your point about, um, you know, when we think about the way we define our roles and, and maybe determining our titles, you know, I refer to myself as a liaison, you know, between the, the commissioner of the NFL and the volunteers and the director of the Super Bowl, Lehman Bennett and all this thing. But, you know, I answer the phones, but I sort of reframed it as I'm the liaison for all these people to make this all come together. Mm-hmm. So, totally. yeah. So anyway, um, you know, we all reframe things at times to, to make a shift. And I think that piece of control is, is really cool. You know, when did you really start viewing life and work through sort of this lens of, of happiness? <laughs> it was kind of funny because it's just really ironic that I'm even doing what I'm doing in happiness because I was never that happy-go-lucky kid growing up. I was actually on the other side being really cynical, <laughs> questioning things, um, listening to like the cure and Depeche Mode. <laughs> uh, I mean, the early day stuff. So like I was just kind of just very pensive and, and dark in some ways just because I was just asking very existential questions as I was growing up of what what is this all really for? So the irony is that I didn't even know that I was working towards happiness when I realized, you know, like there was a, a couple of years in my life where things just swung the other way. And, and it was just really downtime. I, I got laid off from the, the first dot com. Uh, 9-11 happened. My dad was uh, diagnosed with cancer. My core relationship was a mess. It just all happened within, I would say, even like one, one and a half years time in my life. It's those points, one of the lowest, uh, especially when my dad passed, it's just like it really pushed me to think and act upon things differently. Because, you know, once upon a time, I I thought money, title, status meant everything because I had to prove myself and the dot-com busted and I lost it all. So I really questioned, so what is this all for? And so that's when I inadvertently develop my own core values of how I want to make decisions. If it's not money title status, what's it going to be? And for me, it was about the people in my life and maintaining a sense of freedom within myself. So that just clarified a lot of things for me. And I just started living my life based on those priorities and values. And then I stumbled upon something called, you know, scientific happiness and positive psychology. And this is also in parallel with my work at zappos.com. 
And then it dawned on me all the things that I was testing in my own life. There was scientific research that actually backed it all up. And so that's where this whole like this parallel tracks of me trying to figure out, you know, what is this all for? And and then coming across this whole body of research that's already defining it all and realizing that there could be a different way to apply that to my life. And then now, luckily for me, being able to do it on this platform called Delivering Happiness. Yeah. Wow. It's cool. And I loved your story when when you talk about climbing Kilimanjaro with Tony who started that little company and sold it for (laughs) a little bit. And, you know, (laughs) and you guys climbed Kilimanjaro together. And and that was a pretty defining moment for you too, wasn't it? Yeah, it was hugely defining without realizing at that time how defining it was because, you know, it's proverbial, climb that mountain and find out where you want to go. But it was, you know, the metaphor was really true because that was one of my lowest uh, times of my life because I, like I had said, got laid off. My dad was sick and I just didn't know what to do with myself. And so I decided, Hey, I'm just going to do something really out of my comfort zone. Called up my buddy, Tony at the time. He was like, just getting into Zappos as a CEO and asked him if you want to join. He said, sure, why not? And it just opened this whole new, like, I love when you said reframe because it really is about reframing wherever that, you know, that lens was at, at one point it was just funny because we were doing this, climbing this mountain. Tony just sold his company, his first company to Microsoft for about $280 million. I just lost my job. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, clearly opposite spectrums of the financial uh, realm of things. But it was really interesting that we were both during this journey, during this climb, we were thinking the same question, which was, what will we do with our lives if money didn't matter? And we made it, you know, we summited. It was just so surreal, straight out of a movie, watching the sunrise over the Serengeti. And both of us were thinking these same exact things and then feeling that, hey, maybe anything can be possible. And it, that just was a big turning point, uh, I guess, you know, in hindsight for both of us. Well, I hope he paid for all your costs and expenses. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> so, tell, so tell me this. Like you talk about, you know, how happiness isn't just informed by highlights, but sort of also lowlights too, right? That it's not just about all the great moments, but maybe some of the ones that aren't so great. And you have this cool exercise called the happiness heartbeat. Tell me a little bit about that. Maybe you can tell our listeners about it too. It's actually something that we, it's an exercise that we walk through our, uh, with all of our clients and it's pretty simple. So if you can just imagine, you know, heartbeats uh, on a monitor, being able to essentially identify the moments in your life, the highs and lows, and just plot them out, um, uh, you know, with the axes of time and the ha- levels of happiness. And with every one of those points, asking really simple questions like, what values were there or not there? What people were there or not there? And you start answering these questions, it actually starts informing what you as an individual can actually define as sustainable happiness. Because being able to appreciate those highs is so important, but you know, understanding those lows. And for me, as I mentioned, it was getting laid off. It was dad getting sick, losing him. And asking those questions made me realize, well, all, there's a lot of stuff that I was doing at that time that didn't really matter at all. And being able to really just distill it to what mattered the most in those highs and lows. And basically that really helps define that um, sustainable happiness and, and, and sense of purpose. So what's interesting about this heart, heartbeat exercise, this happiness heartbeat exercise, is that it not only applies to individuals, it applies to companies too. So that's why we walk our clients through it, because if you map the highs and lows of the company, um, you know, what happened when you had super uh, low retention or what happened when you had a terrible year of sales and things like that, and you start asking the same questions about values, about people, then you can start getting those answers the root of it as to what needs to be done differently and what can be celebrated because, you know, there were highs along the way too. Well, and I'm sure you've had some awesome success stories, right? When you talk about this model and the work that you do um, at Delivering Happiness, is there a client success story maybe that that you can share that, that potentially there's somebody listening that's in that same spot, right? And maybe yeah. you can help them make a shift. 
Yeah, I'll mention a couple. One of them is just really interesting to me, and the other one's um, it's actually a, a, one of the largest hospital systems in the U.S. Um, but the first one is the government of Dubai, so essentially, uh, you know, the UAE. I don't know if you've been to Dubai or you know about it. I mean, this place is. I, I kind of feel like it's Vegas on steroids. <laughs> it's yeah, just so. Yeah, you probably didn't have to get paid in advance for that gig, right? You knew you were coming. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we worked with their government there to essentially help them define a higher purpose and values within the government body. Yeah, and it's really interesting because, you know, people have their impressions of what the Middle East can be, but. Dubai is interesting because over half of their government body is actually women. And so here we have this sort of petri dish of a government with a very interesting culture, very diverse, and being able to ground it in just having a really defined higher purpose and values. And so now what they're doing is super interesting. They actually created a minister of happiness position within their cabinet now. And so the charter, yeah, yeah it's, it's really incredible. Like, and the charter for her is to essentially take this, you know, fundamental foundational work of happiness and being able to scale it uh, across, you know, the pub public sector, private sector, and essentially, you know, everyone that's, you know, resides within Dubai. So it's just, uh, it's been a really interesting ride. And I'm actually going to go back uh, in February, uh, I got nominated to be a part of this uh, Global Happiness Council. And so basically leaders of happiness around the world will be uh, coming together in uh, Dubai to talk about what's the next step and implementing this stuff, especially for us, specifically within the workplace. So it's really an exciting time um, that these things are not just conceptual, you know, it's actually happening. So Dubai is one. And then the other one is just like I mentioned just because healthcare is on top of everyone's mind. So one of the hospitals that we worked with, uh, it's called Northwell out in, um, out in New York, and they have about 61,000 employees. A few years ago, they decided they want to reach the goal of being the 90th percentile for patient experience by 2019. So it had, they had a few years to get there. So what was really cool about this is that they were so committed to this idea that we want to change the way healthcare is delivered. And the number one way we want to do that is through our employees. And that's our whole motto too, is the equation that happier employees equals happier customers equals more sustainable and successful business. So we did this whole executive alignment workshop with them, created a, helped them create what they call the culture of care uh, program. So essentially their values and help them scale it from their leaders all the way to frontliners, nurses, and doctors. And it was really awesome to see that just in two years, and this is, you know, a huge, pretty big company, a pretty big system. They saw employee engagement grow from 45% to 85% in just those two years. And you worked with them? I mean, you took them from 45 to 85? We worked with them in the foundational stage. So essentially we did the, um, the groundwork with the executive team and, with all that, with, you know, how many hospitals they had, that was like 300 executives. It was kind of crazy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so number one, helping them get that alignment and then helping them define the program to roll it out so that every single person is really, you know, grounded by this culture of care. And so it was just really incredible to see, like, we thought the doctors, this was kind of interesting. We thought the doctors would be the most resistant to it given the stresses, et cetera. But actually they turned out to be one of the most receptive. And what I got out of that was just because, because it's such a high stress environment, because there's so many variables and bureaucracy and stuff with going with government, stuff they cannot control, but bringing it back to their own higher purpose and their own, you know, vision and meaning was essentially why, you know, why did they become a doctor in the first place or a nurse or whatever it is that was so, um, I don't know. That was really surprising in some ways, but so uh, fortifying of what we do. Mm -hmm, it's just like, if we mm -hmm, bring it back to the mm -hmm. why, then it really changes everything else, you know, like like you were describing with your own purpose story of being the liaison. Yeah, those are really, really neat stories. I mean, gosh, I bet, uh, you know, you lay your head down at night and that's got to feel pretty cool, pretty good. That's great stuff. One other question I would have is like, you know, there's so many people in the world who, unfortunately, I mean, if we're being real, don't love the work that they do every day. They don't love what they wake up 
and go do. And, and, you know, I think oftentimes people find themselves in those environments or those situations and they think, well, I'm going to switch jobs, right? I'm going to go to a different company or I'm going to go to a different job or different role. Is that the right approach or, or do we, or do people have more control, you know, over their happiness at work than maybe they might think, right? Is that the first default setting is, is often that, right? Is there another way that you would encourage people to think about that to create a better work environment for themselves potentially? Yeah, um, because you're right. I mean, I think it's, you know, one of the natural instincts is like with my job, I you know, kind of sucks, so I kind of want to go somewhere else. But that's a more of an exterior than an interior way to look at it. So I think a lot of it has to do with what you, we've been talking about is this whole sense of reframing. The way to go about it is like understanding that there's stuff that, you know, a big percentage of our happiness comes from, well, specifically 90% of our perception of happiness comes through our own brain and how it works. So, you know, coming across a situation where is a challenge or a tension at work, and we all have a choice at the end of the day to frame it in a positive way or negative way. And so being able to have that sense of, I have that choice and I'll be able to use it can take any sort of negative exterior uh, circumstance and then, you know, be processed and therefore reframed in a way that can be positive no matter what it is. Because, of course, we can acknowledge there's stuff that we don't like about our jobs, but we can also acknowledge, you know, there are things that we do like about it. And you know, there's some fundamental things like we need to make a living, we need to, you know, pay the bills, et cetera. We have family and friends. So being able to take out all the external factors that we can't control, but being able to say I can control essentially my, you know, how I process things and reframe and therefore my happiness. I think that's where it starts from. And that's why when we start talking about what happiness is, is number one, being true to that weird authentic self. It really helps shed and kind of clear up what it means to have what it can be to have a good job or to have a more enjoyable job because then sure. we're focusing on ourselves versus the external pieces we can't control. Well, and I'm hearing you sort of say, you know, be grateful for the good in it. Is that accurate? Mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of the times what we, I mean, as human beings, we're, we're kind of programmed to focus on the negative because, you know, we want to survive. <laughs> you know, back in the day, we didn't want to be eaten by a tiger or something. But now we have a little less of that danger around us and we have the more we have greater ability to say all right there are really good things around this about this about the job about myself and so let's focus on that and expand on that and it's interesting to see how you when you expand on that then the negative stuff actually diminishes so that's what i need to tell myself when i think i'm getting upgraded on a flight and i end up back in <laughs> row 35 by the potty i mean you just be exactly. grateful that i'm on it yeah First world problems. That's right. I'm going to tap into that. I'm going to tap into that. (laughs) That is awesome. So, you know, our listeners love recommendations and resources like books and podcasts. I know you are a constant learner and uh, you're always digging and finding, um, you know, new ways to get even better and potentially probably, you know, unlock, uh, you know, tools and resources from a happiness perspective. Tell me, what are some of those kinds of resources you recommend that you love, that you lean on, that you think folks would dig? I mean, I, I could talk about like the happiness resources that I, there's actually a whole list of, uh, of books on our site that if people are interested, you could just go to deliveringhappiness.com and, and, and look that up. But what I also think is interesting is stuff that's not necessarily in the field that we're working in. I like constantly learning from, I think it's more enriching just to get our other perspectives um, and sort of fold it in. So business books are one thing, but I, I think, you know, life books are another thing. So just top of mind, one book that I've been recommending um, and it's totally not related <laughs> directly, but it's uh, it's called Scary Close. Um, I'm not remembering the author's name right now, but just a friend That's that okay. sent it to me. Scary Close, got it. Yeah, and so what's interesting about that is about it's just one guy's, he's you know author by trade, and he writes about intimacy. And this sounds like a relationship book, but what I got out of it is like, it's not just about his intimacy with who he turned out to eventually marry his wife. It's about relationships um, on every level of every interaction that we have. And 
that really struck me because it's so applicable across the board of every relationship that we have, whether it's in work or in our lives, you know, outside of work. And it just kind of opened up this sense of going back to who we are, you know, who we were as children, what were like, what are the things that we went through to get to where we are today and, and kind of going through that timeline to be able to help us understand why we do the things we do and strengthen the relationships around us. So it's interesting. I recommended that to my team and to people I've been talking mm. to and every single person like came back to me and said, I, I got this out of it and it's all different. So I thought that was pretty cool. That is good stuff. What's your favorite apps? Favorite apps? Hmm. <laughs> Someone introduced me to um, Camera 360 over the holiday. It's just like the silliest thing, but you should check it out. It just makes everyone look like they're out of a like a, a cartoon or something, like a Japan animation. Cartoon. I think my kids uh, are onto that. My girls, our daughters. No way. Yeah. So. Oh, probably. <laughs> We end every podcast with a rapid fire. Um, and so I'm going to fire some questions at you. And you have high self-awareness. You're going to rock this. And just tell me what comes to mind. Is that okay? You in? Yeah. Sounds good. All right. So one word to describe yourself. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> last book you read. Uh, scary Close. I was thinking that was coming. What's the second <laughs> to last book you read? Um, Second to last. I think it was the memoir that... Uh, the woman that wrote and directed Girls. Uh, what's her name? Dunham, I think her last name is. Okay, cool. Favorite hobby? It's not really a hobby per se, but it's just uh, having meaningful time with my people. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, connectiveness. Mm -hmm, exactly. What's your biggest pet peeve? Hmm. Unhappy people. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny you say that. Actually, I... I really like talking to unhappy people. Really? Because uh, you, yeah, you can make them chef, right? You, it's a challenge yeah. for you, I bet. Yeah, I get yeah. it. Yeah, it's like those naysayers out there are my favorite. Like, It's just really understanding where they're coming from and just seeing you know, how different things can connect to them and, and light bulbs can go off. But yeah, I don't mind that at all. Um, that'd be, um, I guess, just people um, that rush to assumptions about other things and people just... Uh, biased what's the one thing you can't live without okay. iphone i would say i know this is going to sound cheesy again but it's like the people in my life that really inspire me to, to do anything and everything yeah that doesn't sound cheesy to me i'm a big believer that relationships make us happy and drive our success and yeah so i can't live without yeah no question i i get it what brings you the greatest joy i would say that Especially when you know, there's so many things that are happening in our world at an accelerated pace. It's seeing the simple things that people can do and go unnoticed or go unrewarded. Really, the, the, the people that are like the underdogs are my people. <laughs> it's just like getting that, you know, them being them and doing something amazing without mm -hmm. even knowing. Yeah, that's cool. This show is called Game Changers. And so one last question, which is what Game Changer inspires you and why? I think for the past year plus, it has been uh, Elon Musk. Uh, I saw him speak at TED last year. And then I met him really quickly and had a brief chat with him. And just, you know, you read about a lot of things he does. But just seeing him talk about the things that, umpteen things that he's working on it just sounds like he's just like you know it's just a casual chat about what he just happens to do in life and it's so it just seems so natural for him yet it's so mind-blowing <laughs> at all sure sure like has his hands his fingers and, and and really impacting the world in a way that it's just you know just the beginning of what he's doing well yeah elon musk is a game changer that's for sure that is cool and you got to meet him wow very cool yeah yeah, super cool guy. So, Jen, I appreciate you coming on today. You are uh, inspiring, insightful. I love the science behind the work that you do, right? It takes some of the misconceptions or the fluff out of sort of happiness. Um, 
So thank you for what you do. Thank you for the lives that you change and impact in such awesome ways. Thanks so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And it goes both ways. Really, really respect all that you're doing. So thank you for having me on. Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.